very good. Okay. Now we can start. Yeah, Please, thank you. So thank you very much for including the paper in the program and thank you for the excellent organization for this first conference in person. Um, this is joint work with Olivier Dermoni from Columbia Business School and the usual disclaimer applies. So today I'm going to speak about the, the rise of bond financing in Europe. And oh, so it's here. So this paper is motivated by the growth um, in the non-financial corporations bond market in the last uh, two decades in the euro area. Um, several macro trends have been favorable to bond financing and academic literature has looked into that, such as the reduction of uh, bank loan supply, uh, loose monetary policy and low interest rates that um, has uh, increased the risk appetite of investors. Uh, institutional reforms such as changes in the bankruptcy framework that had made um, the bond market to look more stable. But what we do in this paper is that we dissect the aggregate growth through the lens of firm level data and we aim to understand better potential implications of this growth. So we're going to use micro data on firm debt structure and balance sheets over the past two decades. The sample will include both public firms and private firms, even though the sample on private firms is uh, smaller, shorter in period. Um, the main takeaway from the paper is that yes, indeed, there, there has been growth in the bond market. Uh, this has broadened firms' access to credit, to funding, um, and it has affected many firms, both smaller firms and larger firms, but this can also lead to new risks. So this study is quite descriptive. Uh, it's not, uh, there is no causal impact here. Um, it will aim to contribute in the literature in three different ways. So the bond market have been analyzed in the US. Uh, several studies have looked on the developments in the US. But we think that it's particularly interested, interesting to look uh, in Europe, mainly because uh, firms depend on bank financing historically. So this change and the rise of bond financing may lead to a transformation uh, in the way that uh, firms, uh, the, in the source of funding for the firms. Of course, there are macro trends that drive the bond financing in Europe. And the way that we want to contribute is by taking a holistic view over a longer time frame. Include also private firms in the analysis, uh, which is something that hasn't been done before. And look also on potential risk implications. Lastly, we want to contribute in this debate around non-banks and financial fragility. Several studies have highlighted that it may lead to financial fragility. Others argue that it's a relatively stable market, uh, so there is no need to worry. We want to contribute to that by looking on the investor contribution. And we also want to create a link between the previous market expansion and to the 2020 uh, crisis and the downgrades wave. The first fact that I'm going to show you is uh, this rise of the bond market growth and what are the firms that have benefited from that. So on the plot on the left, um, uh, I plot the bond share, the average bond share, the time series, around the uh, firm's uh, quartiles, so depending on their size. And we see that indeed, largest firms are the ones that uh, grew the most. There is the fastest growth. But smaller firms have also increased their bond share, their dependence on bond financing over the total debt. In the plot on the right hand side, uh, I plot the number of new issuers, both of public new issuers and private firms. So firms that enter the bond market for the first time. And we see that there is a continuous entry of firms in the bond market in the last uh, years, in the last two decades. Um, then naturally the question that comes up 
is what are the implications for the firms and for the policy makers. Now, before I continue with the empirical stuff, um, I would like to, to spend the, just a couple of um, few minutes on a very simple illustrative framework that will help us to fix ideas around this bank versus bond financing. This is uh, based on the classical corporate finance theory, so it's not a huge contribution to the theory, it just helps us to fix ideas around this debate. Now, it's a model on equilibrium debt composition, and firms choose investment leverage jointly with a bond share beta. So the bond share is this ratio of bonds versus bank financing. There is a project of scale I that pays return R in the good state of the world and X uh, for in the bad state of the world. Now lenders supply capital and they would require a return of uh, rho. There are financial frictions that limit investment uh, in the sense that firm has access to limited cash alpha and there is a pledgeability friction uh, theta below one of the returns that can be pledged to lenders in state age, in the good state. Now the equilibrium investment I is proportional to the multiplier M. And what makes this setting interesting to us and useful to us is that this uh, multiplier depends on the bond share, so on the debt composition. Now what is the optimal share? The firm will choose the optimal share, uh, bond share, uh, based on this trade-off between bank and bond financing in order to maximize the investment multiplier M. So uh, just to give a bit of intuition about this trade-off, uh, we depend on the classical corporate finance theory. So bank loans have lower downside risk. And why is that? Why bonds have a higher downside risk compared to bank loans? Well, because these uh, are held by dispersed creditors, and theory uh, would say that there is a higher cost of financial distress when the creditors are dispersed. So in the sense that there is lack of coordination, uh, and that can lead on um, a lower probability to uh, achieve an efficient renegotiation. Moreover, legal scholars have highlighted that uh, such coordination failures and the, the, the issues of the dispersed creditors are even more special in Europe because of the bankruptcy system. Another concern that, uh, another reason that uh, bonds have a higher downside risk is because of the uh, bond fund outflows, so potential runs in the case of financial distress from the investor side. And lastly, firms are exposed to rating downgrades. Uh, so this is another risk that they encounter when they, when they issue bonds. Now we're going to model that in a reduced form by assuming that there is a, um, in the low state, uh, the low state payoff decreases with a bond share beta. So what is the advantage of having bonds? The advantage in this case is that bonds economize on intermediation costs, such as uh, monitoring, regulatory costs, market power, in general costs that are associated with bank uh, loans. And again, we're going to model that in a reduced form by assuming that lenders require return rho that decreases with the bond share. What are the, so even though the, this uh, model is very, very simple and uh, nothing uh, special, it gives some interesting empirical predictions. First, it helps us to understand the, the trends that have already been documented in the literature, uh, the, agri the macro trends and firm characteristics. So we see that in the model uh, we can include aggregate growth um, in the, when there is a lower loan supply, loose monetary policy, institutional reforms, we can uh, see that. Uh, it also would predict that the bond market selection, so issuers are on average safer than non-issuers. But what we add with this paper is this firm level predictions. So the change in composition on bond issuers in the sense that we observe that riskier and smaller firms enter the bond market 
uh, in the recent years. And the second is that uh, a prediction on, on, uh, um, on growth and risk. So indeed, firms enter the bond market and the financial constraints are relaxed. So they can borrow more, they can invest more, but at the same time, they are exposed to negative shocks. So something that they didn't have before. Now, um, going back to the empirical facts, uh, first we document a change in composition of bond issuers. And we wanted to do that, the natural way to do that was to look on credit ratings. And indeed, in, when we look on credit ratings from the three largest um, rating agencies, we see that uh, the a first rise of the triple P issuers, the, the, the segment just above speculative grade. Uh, this is also common in the US. This is, a part, this is a trend that we saw also in the US data. So it was not really special for Europe. But what is special for Europe is that um, uh, the, the number of firms that are rated is much smaller. Uh, so only 15% of new issuers get a rating. So overall, we think that just by looking on ratings, it underst understates the uh, underlying shift, uh, in, uh, underlying risk in the market. And that's why we looked on firm characteristics. So we compared public historic issuers with public new issuers and private issuers. And here we see that on average, yes, public historic issuers are larger. So the new, uh, the firms that enter more recently the market are smaller in size, but at the same time they are less profitable and they have higher leverage. And this is especially true for private issuers, which also is the, which is also the set of firms that are, don't have a rating. Now, what do these firms do with the funds that they raise? First of all, the, once they enter the bond market, we see a huge increase in their leverage. The, the first issuance is uh, uh, it's really high. It's approximately 40% of their debt. Then we see that there is a limited substitution between bonds and bank loans. And we see that by looking on these dynamic coefficient plots, where we regress uh, different outcome variables around the base, where we set the base as the year before the first issuance. So we see limited substitution of bank loans, uh, large investment, and uh, growth at the firm level. Uh, but we also see that these firms tend to pay higher interest rates. So oh, overall, we see that firms enter the bond market in order to uh, issue a lot, and for a long period. They extend their maturities a lot. Now, in order to contribute on this debate around fragility, we wanted to look on bond investor composition. Um, and there, is this, there are two different views. One would say that there are long-term investors that invest in the bond market, and that makes it a quite stable environment. But at the same time, there are others who support that there may be a risk here because of outflows, fire sales, market freezes. So we wanted to look on the micro data on investor holdings at the bond level. This is the data that we have at the Euro system. Uh, and then we are comparing the investor composition for different types of issuers. Overall, if we just look on the aggregate data, you would see that 40% of the bonds are held by insurance companies, um, pension funds, and uh, central banks. So you would say, okay, this sounds as uh, quite uh, stable investors, so the market should be okay. But then when we start looking on the matching between investors and firms, uh, and here I plot the investor co contribution for different quartiles of firm size, we see that the composition of investors is very different um, across, uh, across different uh, firms. So for the smaller firms, only 15% of their bonds are held by uh, insurance companies and pension funds, and the ECB is almost holding none of them. There is obviously a firm, firm investor matching that may reinforce fragility 
And this is the point that we would like to, to make with this uh, plot. Of course, this may be driven by investor mandates, but we shouldn't, uh, uh, um, because for example, insurance companies, they may not be interested in weaker issues, but still there may be a, a risk underlying this. Lastly, um, we are looking on rating downgrades. Um, and uh, we want to look on the rating downgrade because it's an obvious financial distress event for the firm and it may have real effects. So in particular, we focus on the bond market turmoil in 2020 that followed uh, the COVID-19 outbreak where there was this spike in spreads and found outflows and a large number of firms were downgraded. But we wanted to see what are the firms that were downgraded. So here, I plot the, um, the number of the firms that were downgraded based on the year that they entered the bond market. Again, just to try to understand whether there are firms that entered more recently or histori historical issues. The blue bars would show the public firms and the private, uh, the red ones, the private firms. So, of course, the, the biggest number are public historical issuers like airline companies, transport corporations, etc. But there is also a large number of private firms that entered more recently uh, and were downgraded during that period. We do a very short analysis in the paper to see what happened for these firms after the downgrade. And we see that most of these firms uh, they tend back, they, they don't uh, proceed with the new issuance afterwards. So it suggests that they may go back to bank financing. So let me conclude by sharing some thoughts about the implications of these uh, facts that I just uh, described. First of all, during the last two decades, there were strong policy efforts um, that aimed to make firms uh, access to uh, finance, they aimed to diversify the sources of financing of the firms and their goal was to increase um, the bond market, to, to lead to the rise of the bond market in Europe. Now was the growth as big as in the US? Perhaps not, but this doesn't mean that the policy efforts were not successful. We see a large number of firms entering the bond market we see that it reached also smaller firms. So in that sense, we can say that uh, such policy initiatives were successful. But what are the risks behind this expansion? Are there policies and what could be potential policies to mitigate uh, such potential new risks? Now there is this debate around investor composition and fragility. And perhaps one idea is to, to look on the example of the Italian mini bonds where there are studies that uh, highlight that this was a successful experiment. What they did in this case is that they restricted um, uh, the, um, uh, the access to issuance of the SMEs, the small, medium uh, enterprises, uh, bond issuance, only to professional investors. And then many argue that this actually helped this, many, this market to take off. Now overall we think that uh, it, it, may, it, it will be important to build a more comprehensive framework of bond supply and uh, macro implications. And in general we see in the paper that many more firms are now exposed to the market turmoil. Naturally then the an open question that we want to raise um, is the following. Should we consider extending lender of last resort policies to the bond market? I guess the answer to this question would depend on what you think causes market turmoil. If you think that market turmoil is purely driven by non-fundamentals and panics, perhaps the answer is yes, we should ex extend it. But if you think that uh, this may be driven by excessive risk taking or reach for yield in the financial markets, then I guess the answer is not so obvious. Now, uh, in general, overall in the paper, um, we have highlighted this growth of uh, bond financing, um, the changes in the, uh, in the um, uh, firms that entered the bond market. Um, so we think 
that it may be time to uh, start considering revisiting the macroprudential toolbox uh, that affects that. Um, I think uh, this paper is in the direction um, that perhaps more work is needed, um, in the direction that uh, uh, confining microdata with the economic framework that may help us answer uh, such questions. Thank you. Thank you, Melina, especially for adapting perfectly well to the scheduled time. And now, Jan Peter, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, for my first thank you, thanks go to Rafael for inviting me to, in, to discuss this paper. First of all, to come to Madrid to this nice conference and then to discuss this paper, which I actually uh, truly enjoy because uh, working on banking for so many years and always feeling there's a, a little bit gap of knowledge about what's happening on the other side uh, of the market, on the bond side, um, has accompanied my work for many years and now this is a starting point, I think, to get a bit deeper in this topic and so I'm very grateful to this opportunity. In my, my work, it's certainly a gap um, and I, I, have been keep, I, I have been thinking about bond financing quite a lot but not really knowing anything in detail, and this is what the paper um, offers. So let me give a short overview of what the paper does. Uh, it basically, it, it's concerned with the euro area. It provides a descriptive analysis of the corporate bond market, particularly for the area for the time 2002 or 2004 to 2018 in part of the paper, for 2002 to 20 for, for other uh, statistics. It looks at the firm level, what is the leverage, what is the debt composition that is uh, uh, happening or developing in firms that have bond access, bond market access. It looks at the market level and asks questions about financial stability. It has a, a sort of um, uh, event type study in the, of the pre-COVID period to analyze what happens when there are downgrades in, um, for, for issuers of, of corporate bonds. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's about it. If you look at the findings, what the paper finds uh, on, mostly on this, on this panel data set, first, the paper documents how the market, the size of the market has been growing over the last 15 to 20 years, 20 years. Um, and so to put it in perspective, the bond market has been growing twice the rate of the, of the, um, of the lending market, um, and at least in part of the data I try to, comp to compute these numbers, so it's, it's rising fast. Um, the paper tells us that it's mostly um, smaller issuers that enter the market, which are also less profitable, which is interpreted as being riskier. The paper also shows that there is no direct substitution uh, with bank loans, so it's not just bonds coming in and bank loans being decreased. So leverage is rising as a result of bond market access. Um, and lastly, they show that the uh, new issues are um, rather of a longer term, um, so the maturity of debt is rising in firms that have this bond market access, although uh, on average about half a year. And lastly, in this pre-COVID study, uh, they, uh, the paper shows that um, the rating downgrades tend to be accompanied by a reduction in bond market access and by an increase uh, in bank lending. So here on the slide, I, I, I said uh, uh, increase the access to bank lending, but it should really be the use of bank lending because that they had all the time. So I think in, in, in some, to address that question to t try to analyze a, a new data set uh, and, and a new market, I think, is a, is a great contribution. <clears throat> the real question is what to focus on. So I think the question, the, the more, my main point is that uh, the paper lacks a focus at, at the moment and it needs to develop that focus. But I think it has all the ingredients and it's a way, um, uh, I think it's more a question of decision by the authors where to put the emphasis and to maybe subtract some parts and to dig a bit deeper in others. And I, that's what I want to, will be basically my, my comments. There are different sections in the paper that are only loosely connected uh, at the 
present stage, and maybe you can find the red thread that binds it all together. And I will offer some, some, some ideas. So let's, um, let's go to, uh, to discussion, um, and I have five more minutes, so I have to be fast. Uh, so I, I wrote here on the slide, the data set is in search of a main question, so that's basically repeating what, 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 I, what I said, because what you are now doing um, uh, is asking the question whether the bond market access is replacing bank debt, so what's the substitution, what's the, the, the I would say, the relationship to existing um, debt, that's one question, and the other thing is, uh, what it does at the corporate level. Is leverage increasing? Is there default risk rising? Uh, maybe is there financial stability? So what's the consequences of having that, um, that bond market established? And of course in Europe that's a main issue, we, uh, a major issue. We want to have more market uh, development and so a general judgment is uh, of course uh, very welcome. Your argument starts with uh, what you call an illustrative uh, framework, uh, the Holmström Tirol based uh, own model that you develop. And I think this is an interesting part in itself, uh, and the results are not really uh, surprising. Um, but what I do not find is that this is really connected to the rest of the paper. So uh, uh, the, the model is not guiding the empirical analysis. Um, in, there's basically, the model is driven by cost differentials for different sources of funding. Um, but these cost differences are not traced out in the data, not developed. Of course, this could be done, but it's in a way an additional effort because it would require to take seriously the idea that the pledgeability or reversibility of assets is a main source where, where uh, also costs are coming from in terms of distress costs. And you would have to have access to some data that would help you to, um, to uh, to, to back this up. So, but, but that's currently not done. <clears throat> it's just more or less illustrating that there is this substitutive behavior between lending and, and bond market. Um, second, my, my second point, which is actually still related to the, to the modeling approach, um, is my, my digging a bit deeper on this substitutive behavior between bank lending and, and, and the issuance of bonds. So, as we know, bond market is rising faster than, than the loan market, but what you are not addressing, I think, enough is what is the role of banks in the bond market. So, if firms have access to the bond market, this is at least to the extent that I know the market, in, that's mostly Germany, it is really a matter of bank decisions. So, banks pave the way to the bond market. It's not an independent thing. Two, two different markets operating independently, but it's actually only one, it's all through the banks. And in that sense, I'm not sure whether the Holmström Tirol approach, which really looks from the firm size and say what's the optimal connection or, or, or composition from the, side, from the view of the bank, of the firm, is really the, the, the correct view if you look at the, let's say, the, the architecture of finance in, in Europe. It's really the banks that decide on debt access, and one might, might also think about a model that looks at banks deciding whether to give a loan or to open the access to, 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 to bond financing. And particularly when you th consider that we have this house bank dominance in, in many, uh, at least in Germany, and maybe also in, in other countries playing a role, they have the informational advantage, they can also provide the, the access to the bond market, then that is a decision where the bank at least takes part and will value and weigh its advantages and disadvantages of letting a firm have um, bond market access. So in that sense, the, the, the lending contract will be responding to the, um, to the bond uh, issue. So once there's a bond issue, I think the bond, loan contracts will, will uh, will uh, re respond, so I, I have here as an example, uh, if lending contracts are endogenous, so uh, the response to a bond issuance will be that the maturity may be reduced, so loan contracts may have reduced maturity, seniority thereby increasing, so they can, one minute, okay, good. So there are, the, I think details of bank lending need to be controlled for. Okay, I just mentioned, uh, since I have only a minute, the, the, the other points that I would like to to get into the paper um, is the question of rating downgrades 
so how, how is the functioning of the bond market, is almost a separate paper, a uh, separate uh, um, uh, question. And uh, I have some um, uh, problems with this idea that because you're on the bond market, there, are, there may be rating, and there are an additional risk factor that is not there in the counterfactual world, in the world where there's no bond market. Because why do ratings have any information that banks don't have? I don't see the relationship between this, so what's the new information that's coming uh, um, through the rating agency? At least I, 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 um, I think that needs to be discussed uh, at, at a minimum. And, uh, and if you go deeper into the uh, rating side, you should also may consider that there is for most the rating downgrades in your paper, which is not a crisis downgrade, but the normal times, there is a watch list, so information flow is much earlier than at the date of the, of the rating uh, downgrade that is eventually being published. Um, to, um, uh, okay, I, I jump over, over four and go to my last one, policy implications. Um, you have relatively strong policy implications, I think, uh, in a way suggesting that land of last resort policies should be activated to protect smaller issuers from turmoils in bond markets. And I think this is bold because the turmoils in bond markets um, are really fundamental events and we are not, I'm not sure whether we want to hinder defaults to happen or want to uh, basically be somehow pushing against debt restructuring, which is really what's happening when you have these, these downgrades, particularly if you think that we have a bank, a banking world, where they take a lead action in all these debt restructurings. Right? So I think this is, the, let's say, the European difference to the US is that banks play a much more active role in the whole um, reorganization of firms and that should be uh, also playing out in, in your analysis at some point. Um, okay, so I think that's the, that's the main point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pieter. Melina, do you want to quickly react? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, these excellent comments. We are in the process of uh, revising the paper, so this is really on time. Thank you. Uh, we think that we have to narrow down a bit the focus. We are exactly on this direction, and that's why we added this part of the investor side um, in the paper. Um, the, the point that you highlighted on the role of banks uh, to the access to the bond market is indeed something that we don't discuss in the paper at all. We didn't have that. So it's a great new addition. We will definitely consider that. Um, but and it's true that it, change, uh, it changes uh, the perspective, so we should think about it hard and see how we can take that into consideration. The downgrades part, I think this is a bit related to the confusion about the version of the paper that you had, uh, because in the last version we are looking on the COVID uh, period downgrades. Um, so uh, we, we changed a bit the analysis there on that. Uh, but indeed, again, the role of the banks in this, uh, in this um, uh, case is something that we need to add in the analysis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And now we have time to take two uh, questions, please. There. Doesn't work. Yeah, I just have to speak and start. Okay. Okay. So, um, the question that I have is one thing that seemed to be really absent is actually uh, Basel free from the whole thing. I mean, you said the private firms use the money for investment and growth, and that strongly suggests that banks were not willing to extend these loans or to these opportunities. And um, that's exactly the time period when regulation changed. And I wonder whether you can speak to that, because the regulation story would explain basically all the patterns that you just showed us. Yeah, so we don't, uh, we don't look on um, uh, uh, loans applications. We don't have this information on whether they reached the bank in or before they entered the bond market. Um, but it's true, we don't say that it, we, that's why I said at the beginning it's not a causal paper. We don't say that it's one or the other. Uh, of course, bankruptcy reforms and institutional changes are very important during that period. But what we wanted to look at this paper is this cross-section 
on who are the firms that enter the bond market and whether this has changed the, uh, the set of the firms. Uh, so I agree, bankruptcy reforms are really important in, in this case. Perfect. Please. Uh, bond markets have coordination, have the potential for coordination failures. And I think you should do more in order to show rather than to assume that this is the case. So, first thing, uh, are, you, uh, are you clear that there was no trustee in these issues? I think that Jan hinted that maybe the banks would say, serve as trustees with the uh, with the authority to trigger liquidation, in which case there is no coordination failure. Second thing, uh, do you know of any case that looks like a bank run or creditors run, particularly after a downgrading? I mean, if you have all these downgradings and you don't have any incidents that look incident that looks like a creditors run, I would. Yes, the problem of coordination failure is, doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so on the second point about runs during downgrades, this is exactly the part that we're working now, uh, looking on the COVID downgrades and uh, see whether there is uh, differences on the way investors reacted uh, based on the firm that they had invested. Uh, we see some runs, uh, especially for smaller firms, which is in line with uh, what I showed you before. So riskier investors match with riskier firms, but I don't have the results yet. This is something that we just did the last few weeks. So it seems that it's there. But again, the point related to Jan's uh, point on coordination on the bank side, and um, yeah, this is something that we have to think more. I don't have an answer on that. Final question, Javier. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Javier Suarez, uh, Zenfi. I think this is the type of paper that has great value through what it describes, but maybe even the type of paper that we like to publish these days uh, has the problem that Jan Peter was uh, so well so well describing. No, it, it seems that these days we want to derive uh, some uh, causal uh, implication or some great uh, new discovery. What I see is terribly um, consistent with micro-funded models of the choice between bank loans and, and bond financing. And to say the truth, I see absolutely nothing worrying from a financial stability perspective. So I, I see that there is this sort of schizophrenic perspective, especially in Europe, that on the one hand, we want a capital markets union. On the other hand, when we call it the non-bank financial intermediation, it looks like a threat. So we want it to grow, and then we see it as a threat. And, and so, so I find that this paper is really in terms of describing facts and should not be biased in terms of trying to communicate that there is something worrying. I, I don't see anything worrying. Of course, if there are downgrades, uh, firms will move back to bank loans or to just not, not being funded. And probably this is a good development, or otherwise, I mean, it was rationalized by Diamond many years ago. So I, I think that maybe just in terms of, of expanding the descriptive value of the paper, I will try to document, for instance, where the maturity profiles of the overall data structure of these firms get lengthened thanks to bond financing, which actually will go in the opposite direction to suggesting existence of fragility. But thank you, because I think it's a very valuable type of work that is unfortunately not very appreciated in scientific journals. No, thank you. And this is exactly the type of discussion that we want to have with this paper. We want to open this discussion on whether we should uh, consider that as a risk, uh, what, uh, what could be uh, policy responses in case we consider that as a risk. We don't take a stance on this is something that we should do, but we want to provide the, the data and the stylized facts in order to open exactly this discussion. So this is very well taken. Thank you.
very quick. It's just a reaction to what Javier said. Well, go ahead, please. I want just to add, uh, uh, you know, re regarding also what already Javier said on the policy implication. Uh, regarding the fact that maybe this turmoil is coming from fundamentals, we need to remember that usually, if it is not due to fundamentals, there are the arbitrageurs in the market. And if they are not working because of the Basel III, it's not that we need to have the central bank to intervene, but we need to solve the problem of Basel III in order to make the, the life of the arbitrageurs, you know, that they can do their job as they were doing before. And on the other side, I think that clearly, well, we already discussed this, but, you know, all the part of the role that the central bank had through all the sample that you have, not only with the QE, but even before by enlarging the eligibility list, do play a role in this, uh, in this uh, because, you know, I have a paper that shows exactly that this large growth is largely due to the inclusion of this type of bonds or the issuer in the list of the eligibility. So uh, on top of the, you know, the trade-off between bank loans and, and bonds, we need to think also on the role that actually the central bank is playing largely in Europe for already, you know, 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but very good, please. So I, I just want to, I think this is a very interesting discussion because what Javier was saying, we should have a type of paper that is just descriptive. And, and when, to say, well, we don't find the, I was saying we should find the, the right uh, hypothesis, but maybe this is not the right way to go, right? So if you don't find such a hypothesis that gives you a stellar result, like a big crisis coming or something like that, it's still so valuable to know something about this market, exactly its structures, its layout, its dependencies, and that is so, but we, I have, other papers where we could never come up with such an exciting story, so this paper, paper never got published. And this is a pity. We should know all about these market details much more, and I think your paper goes in that direction. Thank you. Melina, the thank last you word. very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, it's exactly the discussion that we wanted to have, so I hope we will continue the coffee break in the interest of time. Thank you. So thank you to both of you, Melina, and Peter, and all of you. And now I think it's time for the second paper. Second paper is the value of the new and old intermediation in online tech crowdfunding that is going to be presented by Alberto Manconi and is going to be discussed by Dimitri Arcangesli. Sorry for the pronunciation. All right. First of all, let me thank the organizers for having our paper on the program and all of you for being here. This is joint work with Fabio Brajon, Nicola Pavanini, and Hai Kunjo. And the topic of our paper is online debt crowdfunding, which is a new and fast-growing channel for credit to consumers and small businesses. Now, uh, online debt crowdfunding has gone through an evolution. <clears throat> so in its, in its first incarnation, it mainly came in the form of peer-to-peer -peer credit where individual lenders make loans to individual, so fund individual loans that they find on a platform. And so if you think in terms of the functions that traditionally we, we associate with financial intermediation, here there's, there's no maturity transformation, there's no collection of information going on. So the platform really only provides a platform. What we see now uh, is called marketplace credit. And under this paradigm, the platform assembles portfolios that are then marketed to the lenders. So the lenders invest in these portfolios assembled by the platform. So this brings uh, online debt crowdfunding closer to a traditional bank, but it's still not quite like a bank in the sense that under the marketplace credit model, it is the lenders, not the platform, that bear the cost of early liquidation. So if you uh, want to liquidate your investment, you, you, you need to wait until the underlying loans have been resold. And, uh, and, and, and so this is in contrast to what uh, depository and traditional banks do in the sense that they can always withdraw their deposits without frictions. So we're going to build on all this and we're going to ask what are the effects of the new business model on the lenders, the platform, and credit provision, and we're going to speculate about how the business model can evolve in the future. In case I don't have enough time, let me tell you what we do and what we find. We, we will focus on three facts about online debt crowdfunding. The first is the shift from the peer-to-peer -to, -peer to the marketplace credit paradigm that I already alluded to. 
The second is the degree of maturity mismatch in these marketplace known portfolios. I'm going to show you that it is comparable to what we see in traditional bank lending. And the third are changes in the lender population that suggest that the lenders are on average becoming more risk averse. So we're going to build on these facts to write a novel structural equilibrium model of online debt crowdfunding, and we're going to use this model to run counterfactuals. And our counterfactuals show that uh, the move from the earlier peer-to-peer -peer paradigm to the marketplace credit paradigm raises lender surplus, platform profits, and credit provision. So we can think of it as a, as a welfare improvement. At the same time, we'll also consider a, a fictional bank-like model in which we make the platform, so not the lenders, bear the cost of early liquidation. And we will show you that, uh, uh, in, in general, the performance of the bank-like paradigm is comparable to the marketplace credit paradigm, and under certain conditions, it may be even preferable. Now, I want to tell you right away how we obtain all these results and why we think that we can interpret them the way we do. Before I can do that, I need to take a step back and think of three challenges that we face. The first one is that we need a counterfactual. We need a counterfactual because we want to compare alternative platform paradigms under a set of paribus assumption. But of course, the adoption of a different platform design is, is not going to be a random event. Second challenge, we need microdata. Um, because essentially the force that's going to drive uh, our discussion is uh, uh, the, the, the risk of early liquidation, the cost associated with early liquidation, and that depends on the misalignment between the horizons of the borrowers and the lenders. And so it's on the level of individual borrowers and lenders that we need data. And the third is we need a way to assess the preferences of the lenders because we want to talk about welfare and that's what it revolves around. But of course, preferences are intrinsically unobservable and likely they change with the evolution of the clientele of the platform. So how do we address all this? Challenges one and three we address through the aid of our model. Uh, in particular, we're going to follow a long tradition in the I.O. literature on demand estimation. And uh, we're going to write uh, a model of online debt crowdfunding that nests alternative platform designs as special cases. And so this will allow us to run counterfactuals. In addition to this, our model also recovers lender preferences from observed investment choices. And so this will give us a natural measure of surplus as well as a way to account for the heterogeneity across different lenders in our counterfactuals. Uh, we're going to write this model and we're going to estimate it on a novel data set that uh, comprises the universe of loans as well as loan applications on a leading Chinese marketplace credit platform called RenRenDai. So RenRenDai is the fifth, fifth largest uh, um, marketplace credit platform in China. We can observe every borrower, lender, and loan on this platform as well as the entire set of all the over 5,000 uh, marketplace loan portfolios that are sold on the platform during our sample period. So that takes me to our first fact, uh, the shift from peer-to-peer -peer or direct lending to marketplace credit. So as we see here with the red bars, the, in the early days of the platform, most of the credit was coming in the form of, of direct loans, so peer-to-peer -peer loans, whereas by the end of our sample in, in, in early, to th in, in early to 2017, uh, the um, over 90, 98% of all the loans on the platform are funded as part of a marketplace uh, loan portfolio. Now, the defining feature of these portfolios is a degree of maturity mismatch. So the, the portfolios themselves have a maturity that is at most 24 months, but the underlying loans can have a much longer maturity all the way up to 48 months. So on average, the, the degree of maturity mismatch in these portfolios is, is something like 22 months. And that, turns out to be consistent with what we observe in consumer credit by traditional banks in the United States. Um, why is it important for us? Because it exposes the lenders to risk. So there's this idea that if they want to cash out their investment, if they want to liquidate, they have to wait until the underlying loans have been resold or become part of another a new marketplace loan portfolio. And it seems, and this is our third fact, that the lenders are becoming more risk averse. In particular, and especially for the lenders that invest in marketplace loan portfolios, they tend to hold more diversified portfolios over time and with lower default rates. So we're going to build on all this to write our model. And our model features three players, borrowers, lenders, and the platform. So the borrowers come to the platform and apply for loans, and those loans will appear on the primary market or on the secondary market. And in a moment, I'm going to come back to the secondary market and tell you what, what happens there. Uh, in all other respects, the borrowers are passive agents. And then on top of this, there's the lenders. The lenders can invest outside the platform, so think of that as the outside option, 
or they can invest on the platform. If they invest on the platform, they can either invest through the direct or peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, or they can invest in loan portfolios. If they invest in, through, through the peer-to-peer -peer channel, they can pick loans on the primary or the secondary market. And when they do so, their choices are going to be governed by indirect utility functions that will depend on the characteristics of these loans, such as their return or their maturity. Uh, now, in particular, we allow these preferences to be heterogeneous across investors depending on how active the investors are. And the assumption is that a more active investor has a greater risk tolerance, uh, either because they have deeper pockets or because they have greater familiarity with the platform. Now, the other thing that the lenders can do is they can invest in a portfolio product. Suppose you invest in a portfolio product, at the maturity of the product, you can roll over your investment or you decide to liquidate. If you want to liquidate, then your loans go to the secondary market where either another lender or the platform itself will pick them up. If the platform picks them up, they're going to become part of a new portfolio. Now, this process of liquidating the investment exposes the lenders to, uh, to risk, the risk that the resale time is going to be long, imposing a cost on them. So, because of this, the indirect utilities associated with uh, the investment in a given portfolio product or with the rollover decision also include the resale time on the secondary market that we indicate with this calligraphy L variable um, as part of the indirect utility. Now, if we integrate these indirect utilities, we obtain demand probabilities, which we can interpret as market shares. This is useful for us because in this framework, the log of the ratio to market shares is linear in the preference parameters. And so we're going to be able to recover the preference parameters from the market shares that we observe in the data. The final character in, uh, in our model is the platform. The platform will collect loans from the primary and the secondary market and assemble them into portfolios that are then sold to the investors. Um, here, to model the choices of the platform, we follow a framework introduced by Kojin and Yogo in their 2019 JP that is actually very close to the demand estimation framework that we use for the side of the lenders. So there will be portfolio weights that are a function of the characteristics of the underlying loans. So the platform will have preferences for return or maturity. And the platform will uh, choose portfolio weights so as to maximize expected profits. So in particular, it will set uh, uh, the target return on a portfolio and the degree of maturity mismatch of the portfolio to maximize what? Something that depends on the total amount of money invested on the platform, the market share of each portfolio product, and, uh, and this will be multiplied by the expression in square brackets, which is the, the profits that we make on, e on any given portfolio product. So they will, be they will depend on the portfolio weights, the return that we make on, e on, on any loan, the maturity of the loan, the cost of locating and monitoring these loans, the return that we promise to investors, and finally, any administrative costs. Um, how do we estimate all this? As I said, uh, through this, uh, you know, it's part of the, the nature of this model that allows us to estimate the preference parameters from the observed market shares. And so for convenience here, I'm showing you two separate equations for the market shares of direct loans and portfolio products, but we really estimate one big equation. So implicitly, we're accounting for any trade-offs between the choice um, between the choice between uh, uh, investing through the peer-to-peer -peer channel or in portfolios. Um, we're going to allow the parameters of these, uh, these market shares to depend on the level of, on the presence of active investors in the market. And again, the underlying assumption is that if there are more active investors on the market, the investor population you know, is on average less risk averse or more risk tolerant. Uh, we also estimate a, a linear model for the percentage of a given portfolio that gets rolled over at maturity and uh, for uh, in a similar equation for the, for the portfolio weights. What do we find? We find that when it comes to the lender preferences, demands are increasing in the yields on the loans that are, that are bought. And this is particularly true for investors through the peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, and even more so when the investors are more active. On the other hand, the investors in the marketplace loan portfolios um, are averse to risk, and since they, they dislike liquidity risk, the resale time, especially so if they are less active. Um, when it comes to the preferences of the platform, we allow the platform to have different, uh, uh, quote unquote, preferences over return and maturity for each of the over 5,000 portfolios. So I cannot show you two times 5,000 coefficients, I will show you their distribution. We find that on average, the platform prefers loans with a lower um, expect a lower yield and a longer maturity. So this is consistent with the notion that the platform is trying to target the safer borrowers. And in a sense, it squares with what we see 
in terms of the preference for default rates, so the platform strongly dislikes uh, loans that have a higher default rate. So we're going to take all of these estimates and uh, plug them back into our model in order to run counterfactuals. And so our counterfactuals will compare a baseline marketplace credit model to two alternatives. One is the classic peer-to-peer -peer credit model, and the other is a fictional bank-like credit model in which we make the platform uh, bear the, the cost of early liquidation, as opposed to the investors, which is what happens under the marketplace credit model. So we're going to see how this comparison is affected by uh, liquidity risk and by the degree of risk aversion of the lenders. And we're going to see, you know, in terms of the outcomes that we look at, the, co the, the characteristics of the portfolios that the platform sells to the investors, as well as welfare effects in the form of lender surplus, credit provision, and, and platform profits. So the first set of counterfactuals that I, that I will show you considers a, a baseline level of liquidity risk. So we assume that the resale time on the secondary market is half a day, which is the average that we observe in our data. Now, as I'm going to tell you in a moment, there's a big, big variation around that average, but we can, we can start here as a reference. So what we see is that if we move from the baseline marketplace credit to the peer-to-peer -peer credit model, um, the amount of credit on the platform drops by a factor of three, and, uh, and then the surplus drops by over 50%. So that suggests that the initial move from the earlier peer-to-peer -peer model to the marketplace credit model was a welfare improvement. In contrast, if we compare the marketplace credit, the marketplace credit model to the bank-like credit model, we see that the comparison is much more ambiguous. So uh, the levels of credit provision, lender surplus, and platform profits are very, very close. And so to look, uh, to look more closely into that, uh, we consider a stressed stress test scenario in which uh, we ramp up the resale time on the secondary market from half a day to 30 days. This is of course a big increase, but it's well within uh, the set of resale times, the range of resale times that we observe on the platform. In fact, we observe resale times all the way up to three months and on, a, and on different platforms. The example I have there is, is a funding circle a platform in the UK. We've, we've observed resale times in excess of four months. So we're going to run this comparison under the stress test scenario. Um, and assuming high or low uh, levels of risk-averse invest investors in, uh, in the market. So we will see how the comparison depends on the level of risk aversion in the investor population. Uh, I'm going to do the comparison only with pictures. What do we see? First, uh, the portfolio products that are offered by the platform change. And uh, in particular, under the marketplace credit model, the investors bear the cost of early liquidation. So because we ramped up uh, liquidity risk, the investors demand a higher return to invest, um, and particularly so when they are less risk averse and so more sensitive to returns. And this is that red bar going up that we see to the left of the graph. In contrast, under the bank-like model, the investors are, are shielded from the liquidity risk, but the platform is bearing it. And so we see that it passes this cost through to the investors by offering them a lower return on their portfolios, and these are the green bars going down. But we don't see any big effects when it comes to the maturity mismatch here. What happens to welfare? There are three parts to this. First, lender surplus. Uh, we've just increased liquidity risk. Under the marketplace credit model, the investors bear it. And so, perhaps unsurprisingly, their surplus goes down. Under the bank-like model, the investors are shielded from the extra liquidity risk, and so their surplus remains fairly stable. Um, this is reflected in the volumes of credit that the investors are willing to lend. So under the marketplace credit model, we see that credit provision drops, whereas under the bank-like model, credit provision remains comparable to our baseline in the, with, with, a, with a baseline level of liquidity risk. Um, what happens to the profits of the platform? That depends on the level of risk aversion of the investors. So if the investors are relatively risk tolerant, then the platform on the margin still prefers the marketplace paradigm in the sense that the drop in profits when we increase uh, liquidity risk is lower uh, than under the bank-like paradigm. Uh, in contrast, if the investors are more risk averse, then the platform as well so kind of prefers the, uh, the bank-like model in the sense that the drop in profits associated with our stress test scenario is lower. So all of this is consistent with the following narrative. In, in the early days of the platforms, in the early days of online debt crowdfunding, platforms were only attracting the relatively more risk-seeking investors, and so the peer-to-peer -peer paradigm was, was kind of okay, it was working. Uh, but then as the set of investors that come to the platform expands, 
it includes more and more risk averse investors and so gradually the platform finds it convenient to offer them a product that looks more and more like a traditional bank account would and so uh, a number of these platforms have been applying for banking licenses and actually uh, and recently Zopa in the UK has actually obtained one and so it suggests that this, you know, this, this is in some way consistent with uh, the evidence that we're providing okay this is all that I wanted to say let me wrap up and conclude we uh, develop an, an equilibrium model to study different paradigms of online debt crowdfunding. We look at the peer -to old peer-to-peer -peer, uh, paradigm, the marketplace credit paradigm, and this fictional bank-like paradigm. We compare them in terms of uh, their welfare effects under uh, conditions of uh, high versus low liquidity risk, high versus low investor risk aversion, and we show that under the right conditions, the, uh, the bank-like paradigm, so a product that looks closer to what the traditional bank used to offer, um, can outperform the marketplace credit pattern. Thank you very much. I very much look forward to the feedback. Perfect. Thank you, Alberto. Dimitri. All right. Can I have this day? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dimitri, and I want to thank our organizers for giving this, me this opportunity to comment on this very exciting paper. So, uh, what I want to say, well, this I think is a very cool thing uh, because, uh, well, online crowdfunding is, uh, is exciting stuff, right? So, something that changes uh, the very traditional industry. And it's a two sided platform explicitly, so uh, there is a lot of uh, interesting theoretical aspects of it. Uh, how to I, 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 oh, yeah, I don't know because there was a. Okay. So, and there are a lot of interesting aspects because, I mean, there is a design issue, right? So, how do you design these platforms actually affects what's going to happen there? And, uh, of course, we want to understand what makes them different from the traditional banks. And so, what happens in the paper is that the authors say, well, there are two aspects, two types of products, peer-to-peer -peer lending, when I just find people and I lend them money uh, on the platform, or the platform does this for me, so it gives me a portfolio and just invest in the portfolio. And the key thing that uh, they emphasize is that, well, what's different about the portfolio is the liquidity risk. When I invest directly, I kind of invest for the whole uh, three years, um, maybe. But typically for the uh, portfolios, I invest for one year or maybe one year and a half, whereas the underlying bonds, they are longer. And so then I need to resell myself instead of the platform doing that for me. Well, I need to, not myself, but I need to wait when someone buys this uh, share of the portfolio later in the secondary market. So, and in terms of the model, what happens is that uh, the borrowers, they are exogenous, so they just even, nothing changes, the platform doesn't, make, doesn't, doesn't affect them in any way, so they just arrive. Uh, with the money uh, or with the, with the request for money, uh, and then the uh, well, lenders, they choose different products in the typical discrete choice framework. So, and then the key parameters there, of course, there are rates, there are maturities, and this expected liquidity of a product, or what was called L, this waiting time, how long it's going to take for me to resell uh, the share. And so, when, when maturity this time comes, I as a lender, I can decide whether I want to go into that reselling thing, or I can lower, and this is a binary decision, another binary thing. And uh, then what the platform does, it basically kind of selects the portfolios. And the portfolios themselves, the number of portfolios is given, so it doesn't change over time. Uh, but what's kind of what matters is what I'm going to put inside. So this is on high level. So in terms of what I want to say on the model, well, so I was a little bit surprised that uh, the, the one side was exogenous, right? So that the borrower side was exogenous because I was thinking, well, if I'm thinking about the platform design, then the two-sided markets, they are like, it's fundamental that uh, one side affects the other side and the whole thing of the platform design is to attract these guys, right? So that they are uh, both, both, both uh, lenders and borrowers. So, uh, that is one limitation, I think, which kind of at least has to be discussed. And then, well, there is this discussion about the maturity of liquidity risk, but at the end of the day, like formally, there is no risk in this model. So investors, when they make the decisions, so there is this um, parameter L in the presentation, and in the paper it was sigma, uh, so that's why I use sigma, I apologize for that. Uh, so there is this parameter and you kind of know it exactly. So when you make a decision, you kind of know exactly how long it will take for you to resell. 
So uh, there is no uncertainty about that. There is variation, of course, about that, but there is no uncertainty. And then, well, this is a minor point, but I was also a bit surprised when I saw that there is initially a lot of heterogeneity in the investment decisions, but some, somehow this heterogeneity disappears at the, at the rollover decision. So at the beginning, everybody is uh, very different, but when they need to decide to rollover, it's kind of all the same. Uh, and then in terms of the platform choice, there is kind of a bit weird thing. So the platform, it really cares about the maturity mismatch, right? So it's like, okay, there are the Sloans, I need to think about what I'm gonna put inside because, well, kind of, I'm gonna, the borrower's gonna pay me the, for the whole time, uh, whereas the lenders are gonna pay me for the period of the loan. Uh, but then, kind of investors don't care about that at all in the model. So they don't care at all about what's in the, what's in the portfolio. So they have this parameter again, that I, I sigma in the paper and L in this presentation, which is the how long are you gonna wait to resell, and that's, that's what they care about, but that's fixed characteristic in the, in the, for them. It's just a characteristic of a portfolio, it's just given. Uh, so it's not a choice. The authors discuss whether kind of it has to be a choice or not, it's unclear, uh, but at least kind of conceptually it's a bit weird that platform that does care about this, whereas the people who uh, lend the money, they don't. Okay. Uh, now in terms of the, what happens in estimation and identification of the model, so, uh, yeah, thanks. So the, there is this heterogeneity at the beginning, right? So it, we think, okay, like, there's gonna be a lot of variation there. The uh, investor, there's a lot of data, different investors. But then, uh, unless I'm mistaken, so what happens then uh, is that uh, the model essentially is estimated for the average investor. So that average is time specific. So in some periods, there are a lot of uh, kind of sophisticated investors, so that average is high, uh, and then there are not, at some periods there are not that many, and so it's low, but kind of at the end of the day, it's for the average guy, not for the heterogeneous guys. And I think that's important, because at the end of the day, these counterfactuals that are gonna be run later, they're gonna be in the very unusual part of the parameter space. So this high levels of waiting times, this is not something that we see in the data a lot, and the demands, this kind of logic stuff, it's uh, highly nonlinear, and so I would think uh, that that might affect things at the end of the day. So whether you do it for average or for the kind of for the for the uh, kind of average of the functions or for the function of the average. And so the other conceptual more point is that well there is this parameter that I keep coming back to this waiting time. And what the author shows uh, show in is that well if you look at it, this parameter, then there is not that much you can predict about it after you kind of take out the, say, daily fixed effect. So it's really not a very predictable thing. And then you say, okay, my investors know this exactly when they invest, right? So they kind of know what it is. And this is a bit weird because kind of, if it's very hard to predict and then it varies at the end of the day, how come that they know it at the time that they invest, right? So, and this variation kind of plays a role. At the end of the day, it's very important because it allows uh, the authors to pin down this idea of how, how important uh, this waiting time is going to be. And so it's a little bit unclear to me that this variation is really kind of mm, that clear, okay? that, that the investors, when they make the decision, that they understand what's going on rather than basing the decision on something expected, like what's going to be the expected waiting time. Okay, in terms of the results, mm, very interesting counterfactuals. Uh, mm. And, uh, but I think that the welfare improvement fact of like going from peer led into marketplace, well, if I think that would be expected just from the very first slide, when you see that, well, the rise of the marketplace lending, uh, it's 98%, uh, I think, uh, at the end of the day. So, and the investors do have the choice to go for the peer to peer, right? So it's a little bit uh, kind of, I expected that, well, it's gonna be super important at the end of the day. So. Uh, the fact that it's well improvement, I think, is, uh, is nice, but again, what have we learned from the structural model here? Uh, that the result that there is equivalence, more or less, between bank type and marketplace models for the baseline scenario is also expected because there is not that much variation in the, 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 this parameter about the liquidity risk, the waiting times, it's very small in the data, most likely. So some, in some cases, it's three months, but in most cases, it's just half a day. Uh, so again, uh, we would expect that things do not change really a lot. And then there is this conjecture where we say, well, imagine that we have long waiting times. And that is, um, 
And that is kind of interesting, but also it is unclear how much we can learn about this from the data. Because it is true uh, that in the data we observe th up to three months of waiting times. But at the same time, uh, there are two aspects of it. First, there is a very small proportion where it happens. So kind of when I run my regressions, this is informed by very, very few observations. That's one. The second thing is that it's very unclear to me that the investors, when they make these decisions, they really know that it's going to take them three months. Right? So we say that they know, but it's unclear because maybe they expect the more ordinary stuff, like one day. And so, uh, yeah, I'm going to finish now. And so I think this is important, and uh, this, is, uh, this is important kind of really kind of key for counterfactuals. Now, in terms of going forward, I think it would be nice to really pin down the variation in this waiting times that we can think is A, known to the investors when they make choice, and kind of we can credibly say that. And the second thing is to kind of large enough to inform counterfactuals. So I can say, okay, in this particular situation, investors knew that it's going to take a month, and I kind of see how it affects the decisions. So then uh, maybe, again, maybe I missed something, and Alberto is going to comment on this. Uh, so I think that it would be nice to separately estimate the model for active and non-active investors and sort of the kind of the average one. Uh, and I think it will make the counterfactuals more transparent. And then uh, in terms of the model itself, if you look at the results, then there is this part of the portfolio decision based by the, by the platform. Mm. And if you look at what happens in all the counterfactuals, well, basically, the composition uh, is more or less stable. The maturity mismatch is more or less fixed. Uh, so what changes is really are the interest rates that they offer to the investors. So it's a bit unclear to me whether then it's uh, worth going into so much detail about that rather than doing the model in a more uh, transparent way where it would be just mostly interest rate decision. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. Alberto, do you want to react? All right. Uh, thank you very much for for your feedback. All, all points are well taken, so I'll, I'll just try to do try, try to say something about the ones that we that, that I can meaningfully say something about right now. Uh, the first point is yes. I apologize for changing sigma to L. Um, we thought sigma would induce in people to think it's something else, and sure, so sure, we decided sure. okay, no mutation needed to be to be handled. Now speaking of. Uh, um, Sigma L, resale time on the secondary market. Um, so the point that we're trying to make, where we show that it's largely captured by fixed effects, it's not that, uh, it's not so much that it's hard to predict as uh, it's something that, it, that really seems to be outside of the control of the platform. So it seems to be mainly driven by the, by, by the, the type of demand that there is for the products of the platform, and that seems to be a cyclical thing, uh, by and large. Um, but I, I agree with you that we, we could be clearer about that. The other thing that I wanted to um, say a couple of things about is uh, this idea that uh, you know we're estimating things for the we're estimating things for the average lender on the platform, um, and maybe we could run a separate estimation for the active and uh, less active investors. So there's essentially two approaches to doing that in uh, in this demand estimation literature. One is uh, Barry '94, and the other is BLP. And so Berry 94 essentially does the average. And BLP, uh, you know, they, they exploit the fact that each guy can be treated, uh, can be treated independently. The, um, the beauty of the first approach we're using is that you can get a few more closed form expressions. With BLP, you, you gotta simulate. So there, there's a cost to doing BLP, and that's essentially computational. In terms of, uh, you know, bank for the buck, what do we get if we go for BLP? Essentially, we're going to get uh, uh, a, a distribution that we can summarize in terms of mean and variance. What we're doing now is we have mean and the deviation from the mean. So we thought, okay, it could be equivalent. But maybe in the background, we could also see if anything changes meaningfully if we instead uh, do BLP. So thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I can get your slides and maybe we can talk more awesome. about it. Thank you. And now it's your turn. Please. Yes, a minute. Yes, a minute. Uh, so I was just wondering, so it looks like Peter here was this cool, novel thing at the beginning, and now it's starting to look more like a bank. They just borrow short and lend long, and so it's starting to look more like regulatory arbitrage and less like this, this new world that we're, we're entering, and I'm wondering if you think that's 
the story or if you have another more positive view. Because it, it's also like um, your stress test, it looks like a bank, except in the it's worse than a bank. Right? It's a, and so it's like the same mean but higher variance. So that could only happen in equilibrium if it's, if it's a regulatory arbitrage. That's sort of my interpretation, but I don't know if you can maybe convince me that I'm being too cynical. So I don't, I don't, I don't think you're being cynical. Uh, let me give you a slightly different uh, um, view of what we think is going on and how it squares with, we think it squares with what we're showing. Um, so what, what's happening in the U.S. to prosper and lending club? Uh, they start offering portfolios, then they shut down their secondary market in the sense that as an individual investor, you can no longer go there. So that secondary market exists in the background, and it's only there for the platform to make new portfolios and sell them to investors. And then there's, um, as far as I understand, what they're going for now is, uh, is, is sort of a, a segmented market. So. They're, invest, they're, they're offering to the, to the institutional investors these marketplace loan portfolios, and the understanding is that these institutional investors have sort of a greater appetite for risk. And at the same time, I think this was in the news a couple of days ago, so uh, Lending Club is starting to offer bank-like products. They, they actually have one of their uh, findings with the SEC last year. They said, you know, we're going to become kind of a bank. We're going to offer, I'm not sure I'm, I'm quoting verbatim, but this is something like we're going to offer uh, a full range of banking products. So I can see that, uh, uh, you know, with different clients, different things work, and, and I can imagine that. So with a, similar to what we're showing, with the more risk-averse investors, the marketplace credit model works. Sorry, the, the, the less risk-averse investors, the marketplace credit model kind of works. And with the more risk-averse ones, you essentially need a bank type of product. There is another question there. So I want to say a word about cynicism. Um, it's true that, that uh, peer to peer lenders uh, become increasingly like, like banks. Uh, to some extent, even more than what you have said, because banks issue loans and then they securitize them, peer to peer uh, securitize at the point of issue. So, uh, in that respect, it, there's even more similarity. Uh, although conceptually they do the same stuff at least in the United Kingdom, they opened the market for unsecured uh, SME debt, which did not exist before. And they uh, expanded the amount of credit available to SMEs in a very significant manner. So maybe it is not that the, 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 the peers, the, the peers are so banks You know, from a, theor from a theorist point of view, yeah, there's nothing new. Why, why do you waste our time? But practically, I think there's, there's something there. Thank you. I actually, <laughs> this, this, this is very useful. Maybe we can talk a bit more also about what's, what's happening institutionally in the UK. I mean, I'm less familiar with it, uh, but I'd love to hear about it. Rafa, final question. Is, is there any way in which you can incorporate the borrowers into the picture so you have a, a real two-sided platform? I know that the model is already very complicated, but it seems in the light of Dimitri's comments that that would be a, an important side of the story. Long story short, I'd have to think. It's not trivial to endogenize the borrower side. Um, and to some extent, you know, we've been focusing on the other side also in terms of what, you know, what question we were trying to ask. Uh, so off the top of my head, I, I don't want to speculate too much. Um, there might be, yes, a cost in terms of you know, the complexity of what we're doing. Um, I'd have to think about what we can get out of it. Oh, final question. <laughs> Just a curiosity, what type of competition then this change of the model is creating to the banks? Uh, 
are then banks, you know, given that they are becoming similar and similar to banks, does it mean that, that at the end, uh, you know, the old way to think to banks will disappear and they will be pretty much just the new banks or, uh, you know, banks will just do intermediation for corporate and all this uh, part related to individuals, borrowers, will be done by, by this type of, uh, uh, of business. So what's happened? You know, now they're becoming similar to banks. So what happens to the banks then? How the banks react? So that's a, that's a good question. I think also it relates to Arnold's point about what's happening in the UK. You know? So my impression is that to some extent, I mean, specifically for the setting that we're looking at in China, I think they are they're sort of filling in a niche that the traditional banks were not capable of filling. Um, lately, there has been some regulatory pressure on these platforms. There used to be a very big number of them, and they kind of came down on, 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 on them like a ton of bricks, and so now there's a much smaller number. Um, at the same time, the government was apparently sort of trying to induce the traditional banks to lend to small businesses, and, and it seems like it's, it's not that easy. So, uh, of course, it's, it's China, so if the government says lend to the small bank, lend to the small firms, the banks will, uh, but then, uh, you know, apparently they have issues in terms of collecting the information, monitoring these loans, that in some ways uh, the, uh, the platforms seem to be uh, better capable of handling. This is anecdotal, of course, so you know, we're, we're speculating, so this is what I can say. So thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Dimitri. And in the closing paper of the, of the session, we are going to discuss specifically on the reaction of uh, the traditional inter intermediation, the banks. So David Martinez Mieres is going to present the paper who truly bears the bank uh, taxes, evidence from only shifting statutory incidents. And afterwards, Ernest Louis Bontain from the University of Mannheim is going to, to discuss the paper. So, David. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you very much. So, this is, as you can see, joint work with Gabriel, who's there. So, you know, he's the one that really knows what's going on, and Jose Luis. Um, anyway, let me start by basically reminding everyone of two concepts that at least it, it were, they were very helpful for me in doing this paper. One is, what is the economic incidence of attacks? And that's basically an economic concept. That's what we economists think about is, well, if I'm inserting a tax or I'm changing a tax rate, who is affected and by how much? Okay? Then there's another concept that is much more of a legal concept, and that's the statutory incidence of a tax, which basically means which agent has to actually pay the tax. So it's a legal obligation, yeah? Is it the consumer? Is it the borrower? Who is the one that has to pay? Well, can they be different? Yes. Think about the basic Econ 101 model. You introduce a tax on a producer. What does the producer do? He shifts the prices. He increases prices, and then this affects consumers. Okay, so in principle, the economic incidents and the statutory incidents are different things. Moreover, like this issue of public, it's, it has been studied in public economics, and there's this sort of principle called the Dalton's Law that says, you know, the economic incidence of a transaction tax only depends, and this is very important, on price elasticities. Well, the corollary of this, if the only thing that matters are price elasticities, statutory incidence does not matter. This is the relevance principle that basically Kolikov and Summer, for example, start and say, well, the agent on which you levy a tax does not affect welfare. Why? And this is basically the important thing that we're going to focus on. Why? Well, because prices react. Okay? Everything goes through prices. Well, this is the starting point of our paper. Starting point of our paper is, well, we're going to study if indeed there's, this re there's the irrelevance or not of this statutory incidence. Okay? What's the issue? Well, the issue is just fine in the basic frictionless market, we know it shouldn't matter, but Will and Fabinger, for example, already highlight that there's some frictions, tax awareness, etc., that could affect this statutory relevance principle. And the problem is that in reality it's difficult to test. Why is this difficult? Well, think about what you basically need is that from an empirical perspective you need to change only who has to pay the tax without changing other issues of the tax, which is normally not the case. Okay, there's one or two examples that have done it using basically experiments, like the Cherry paper, but what we argue is that Spain mortgage market 
actually is going to be a very nice quasi-experimental setting to analyze this issue. Why? Well, basically for the following reasons. First, what happened in Spain in 2018, in November 2018, was a shift, and this is crucial, only on statutory incidents. So there were no shifts in any other elements of taxation that happened. And what happened then? Well, basically, borrowers stopped paying a mortgage-related tax. I'm going to explain that. And then it was the lenders, the banks, basically, who had to start paying that tax. Okay? That's the first thing that happened. The second thing, so that would give us the pre-post type of thing, the second thing that happened is, well, in Spain we have a federal, sort of a federal tax system that basically allows us to identify. Why? Because there are different regions that actually are going to have different base tax rates, and importantly, one of the things that we're going to lever on is that there's one region, the Basque Country in Spain, for which primary residents were exempt. So this is going to be sort of our control. We're going to use also different treatments, but basically just to simplify, think about the Basque Country, nothing happened there. In the other places of Spain, there was this shift. Okay, and we're going to use that to identify. And the third part is that, as you will see, we're going to go not only for average effects, but also for heterogeneous effects, which I think is, we think is very, are very relevant. And for that, we're going to exploit, you know, what you probably already know, this beautiful data that we have in Spain and in other countries that are going to allow to see, well, is this the same for certain characteristics or not others, okay? So basically, in short, what we want to see is, is there a relevance of statutory incidents and what are distortionary effects in case that there's no irrelevance, okay? So what's the answer? Well, first what we find is that in line with this idea of price shifting, there's a high pass-through. What do we mean by high pass-through? Well, basically, on average, there was a 10 basis point increase when we shifted from the consumers to the lenders. But importantly, our results suggest that this is only 80%. So there's not a full pass-through. There's, on average, 80% of pass-through. And interestingly, we find that there's huge heterogeneity in this pass-through. Okay, there are especially borrower characteristics, but also bank characteristics, that actually matter for this 10 basis point pass-through. So for you to have some idea, if you compare levels of income, for example, 75% of the distribution to 25, you go for a difference of eight basis points. That's nearly all of the Fed. Yeah, you have 10 basis points, eight basis points are the difference between the high income and the low income people. And then there's other important issues like, do you have lending relationships? Are there more banks in the area? I will explain that, but just highlight or get into your head that there's heterogeneity in this pastor. And finally, we find that consistent with this idea of the pass-through not being full, this first result, we find that basically banks react to this in two dimensions, two primary dimensions. One of them is that they reduce mortgage insurance. You can think that as a little bit of risk-taking in line with these theories of, well, if my rents are reduced, I go and risk-take, but also spillovers to other markets. Which markets? Consumer borrowing. You know, when we argue that consumer borrowing is on average riskier, than mortgage lending, so we can think this also as a, as a risk-taking effect. Okay, so this is a nutshell what we try to do in this paper. And just a brief overview of what the tax is in reality. Well, think of this tax basically as a stamp duty tax. Okay, to legally document your mortgage, you have to pay this tax. And this tax, as I said, was paid by borrowers before November and shifted to be paid by banks after November 2018. Now, what is the tax based on? It's based on a concept that is mortgage liability. Basically, this is the collateral of the mortgage. Okay, so in Spain, when you, you, when you have a mortgage, basically in the contract, you set up the mortgage liability, which is on average 1.5 times the value of the mortgage, of the house, or of the loan. Why? Well, basically, because this allows you to recover, you know, costs of recovering the house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, What's the interesting fact? The interesting fact is that in Spain, this tax rate, the tax basically varies across regions. As I said, the Basque Country has a zero tax rate for historical reasons, but it's not only that. Different regions in Spain are going to have different tax rates. You know, Madrid has 0.75%, Catalonia has 1.5%, Rioja has 1%. You know, we are going to exploit that also. This is basically the map of Spain, and you can see the Basque Country is the shaded gray area, for those of you that want to know where it is. That's up there, that has zero, and then you can see that there's heterogeneity across that we are also going to level. Okay, but the main specification I'm going to talk about is compare the Basque Country with all of the other regions. Okay? Now, just a brief timeline, what happened? It's interesting, if you are in Spain, it's interesting. If not, I'm not so sure it's so interesting, but basically the movement starting on 18th of October, 
okay? But basically nothing happened up till the 6th, the 6th of November. And then the government stepped in and said, well, we're going to have this tax. It was very abrupt. They entered into, in the 8th and said, well, there's a tax change, and this is going to be affected on the 10th of October. You might worry about pre-trends. We analyze them. There's no pre-trends, but basically that's how the situation worked, okay? Now, we end our data set in May 2010, basically because there was an overhaul of the mortgage market uh, regulation in Spain, and we don't want to have confounding effects. So basically, our time period is beginning 2018 and in, in May 2019, okay? So which data are we going to lever on? We're going to lever on this trade register of the borrowers that the Bank of Spain has. Importantly, this is going to allow us to also exploit a lot of heterogeneity. That's something important. And then, given that we analyze spillovers, and we're going to want to know if different banks do different things, we're going to lever other data that the Bank of Spain has, like, for example, application data. OK? Now, forget about the descriptive statistics. What you would think happens, mortgages are much bigger than consumer credit. Something that is important to have some idea of what numbers we're talking about is what's the average mortgage in Spain? It's around 100,000 euros. What's the average tax we're talking about? It's around 1,700 euros. So that you gather what, what are the magnitudes we're talking about. Consumer credit, well, consumer is shorter maturity, much more smaller, much higher interest rates, much higher default rates. Okay, nothing weird here. Now, as I said, what's the empirical strategy? Well, it's going to be a basic diff and diff. We're going to lever on this, what we argue, exogenous change in the policy in, in November. And we're going to, based on this fundamental lever, that there's no change in any of these regions in the tax rate. OK? It's only the shift in the statutory incidence. Now, I guess I'm gonna, as I told you, we're going to basically base ourselves on the idea that in the past country, the primary residents are exempt from the tax, so there was no change for them, versus in the other, country, in the other uh, uh, regions of Spain, they were. But in the end, we're going to lever also a continuous treatment, okay? And finally, we're going to focus on two types of agents. We're going to focus, of course, on borrowers and lenders in the mortgage market, but we're going to also look at, you know, possible spillover effects for other borrowers in the consumer market, okay? So that's the agents we're going to analyze. Now, what are we, we going to basically do? As I said, diff and diff, our coefficient interest is beta, post clear after November, 2000, after November 2018, that's the post period. And the treated area, this is important, is where the house is located. Okay, you're located outside of the Basque Country, you're treated, you're located inside the Basque Country, when you, the, your house is located in the Basque Country, then you're not treated. Okay, and then we're gonna have some set of controls. By the way, given that there's been a lot of talk about this, we're not doing Pojamian here. You don't ask for two mortgages at the same time, so we're not doing that type of thing, okay? Anyway, good. We'll have the problem, our own problems, uh, I'm not claiming. This is for the average results. Now, we're going to go for the heterogeneity. Well, the only thing we do, effectively, is a triple interaction. Okay, you have the post, the treatment, and they say, well, is this effect different for different types of characteristics? And we're going to use borrower characteristics, but also, interestingly, borrower bank characteristics. Now, you know, have you had a relationship with your bank before? Didn't you have? And we're going to lever on that, okay? Now. There's some issues that I think we tackle, and, but I think they're better seen when you see the, the graphs. Maybe let me tell you just one thing that would worry me a lot in this type of analysis is, well, did the actual demand for credit change? You know, were people waiting for this change and did they change? Well, actually, again, think about it. This is 1,000 euros tax on your house. We see that there's no observable differences pre and post and in the region. So there's no, it doesn't look like there's a, this change. Which, doesn't surprise me given the amount we're talking about. If we were talking about other amounts, I'm not sure we could be saying this, but here it seems that that's the case, okay? And well, what's the plan of attack? Let me first tell you the average results, then we're gonna go to the heterogeneity results, and then at the end we're gonna go to the spillovers, okay? So that's the idea. So what's the average result? Well, what happens to interest rates? Well, basically we have, we control for different things, we do, but basically the main uh, coefficient and it's very stable is 10 basis points that we're talking about. So there was this pass-through of 10 basis points when we did the change. Nice. That's what we would expect from Econ 101. Fine. Now, you might worry about, well, maybe maybe there's some pretense, anything like that. This is the monthly estimated. You can, well, it's up to you to decide, but basically there's maybe no pretrend, or we argue there's no pretrend up till 
the November shift, and then there's a clear jump in November. And then I'm not going to show you today, but basically you can dig, 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 dig deeper into when does it happen. It actually happens after it takes place in the 10th of, in the 10th of November. Okay? But you can see this jump, it stays there at 10 basis points. Now, you could argue, well, maybe comparing the Basque Country with other regions of Spain is, even if you control for, for a lot of your variables, is not enough. Well, we're going to locate, we're going to center ourselves only on people that are five kilometers around the border of the Basque Country. Okay? So then when we do that, what do we find? Well, of course, the, the size of the distribution changes a lot. So we, we lose 99% of the observations, but the estimated coefficient is very similar. Okay, what's the, the bad part of this is that the heterogeneity result, we cannot lever too much on it because we only have 1,000 or 2,000 people around. But what makes us very comfortable is that we still get the 10 basis point results. So it's not about, it looks like our controls are controlling for any differences across regions that could exist. Now, the last thing we do in, in this time is, well, we, we're using also this continuous treatment effect. So instead of going from the Basque Country outside, so well, let's compare also Madrid with Catalonia because they have different tax rates, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, we basically find the same results if we use the continuous treatment effect than if we use. We have to back out the estimates from there, but it's again the 10 basis point estimate, okay? Let me skip the other robustness because they're not relevant for today. So then what we found is, okay, there's 10 basis points on average, that's nice. Now, there's two questions that we want to answer is, first, is it the same for all the borrowers? And second, what does this account for? Does this account for 100% of the tax or not? So first, is it the same for all the borrowers? You cannot see anything, don't worry. What, what happens? Well, basically, there's characteristics of the borrowers that matter for this pass-through. Which characteristics are there? Forget, don't look at those numbers. I, I, I prefer when there's economic issues behind it. So let me compare the 75 percentile of the distribution with the 25 percentile on different characteristics. So what are we talking about? For example, income. We're talking about an average of 32,000K individual versus 24,000K. Okay, what happens there? Well, the pass-through is eight basis points lower. So basically that's telling you that nearly all of the effect is happening on this range of difference of income. Okay, but you can only, you can look at other things, like for example, number of banks in your zip code, well, there's two basis points difference. So that tells you that how many banks are around you also matters for the past. Okay, number of bank relationships. Did you have relationships with more than one bank before or not? That's seven basis points difference. Okay, and something that's very interesting, this is a detail, but this actually makes us very comfortable, is if you're a bank employee or not. If you're a bank employee, you basically see no pass-through. And this is in line with the actual agreements that you know, bank employees have in the spy system. This is a detail. For, for the Spanish individuals, if you're interested, we can talk later, but basically that's what should have happened and that's what we retreat. That if you're a bank employee, there's basically no pass-through, okay? Now, the question is, is there a full, full pass-through on average or not? Well, for this, we what we basically do is two things. First, we say, well, take the average mortgage, calculate what is the, these 10 basis points net present value, using all the information, maturity, we have all that. And basically what we find is, well, the crucial question, sorry there, is what's the appropriate discount rate? We don't know that. So basically we're gonna use two discount rates. One is the government bond, the 10-year government bond. I think that's the most conservative estimate. And another one would be a yield to maturity argument, we would use the average mortgage rate to use it. But anyway, in both cases what we find is that the, the net present value of those 10 basis points is either 1,400 or 1,100 which is not enough to compensate the average 1,700 euro. So you, the banks are not passing through all of this. This is for the average mortgage. We can do a similar thing in mortgage per mortgage. Let me just show you the results here. Basically what we find is that on average, there's four basis points that are not passed through, okay, in line with our results. And this is very interesting, when we split the sample on the 75% income versus the lower than 75% income, we see that the pass through is full for the below 75%, and it's basically nothing for the above, which again gives us this heterogeneity idea, okay? Now, I think the big elephant in the room would be, well, this is risk. It's not risk, I don't have time to explain, but basically it's not consistent with the, with the risk profile that you have and the risk magnitude. So we could explain one basis point difference, but not 13 basis points difference. That's basically one of the things that we can talk about. And now we are gonna change to, okay, once we know the effect on the interest rate, our other decisions change, on the mortgage market and outside of the mortgage market. So first, in other mortgage terms, the answer basically is 
no other decisions except one. So we see no quantity differences, we see no maturity differences, no loan to, va no loan to value differences, so people are not buying different houses, no different uh, changes in default. So risk doesn't seem to be affected primarily by that. What's the thing that changes? The mortgage liability, which remember is the base of the tax. And this is again in line. If I'm not going to pass through all of the cost, then probably I'm going to reduce the mortgage liability. That's what we find. Here, sorry, is the only line of what you have said. It's loan over mortgage liability. So if mortgage liability goes down, the graph is up. Sorry for that. Probably it's not the best way to see it. But again, you can see that there's no pretend, and then you see this jump. Okay, so mortgage liability is dropping after the pass. Okay, and then just in a nutshell, this is not based on borrower characteristics. You could say, okay, this is what is explaining the difference in borrower characteristics that we found before. No, the the drop. It looks like the drop in mortgage liability happens at the corporate level. So the bank decides to lower the mortgage liability, whereas the interest rate is more of an individual to individual bargaining decision. Okay. So now, once we have this, we, we want to finish by talking about the effects on spillovers, on all the consumer loans, okay? What do we find? Well, basically, let me just shift to the results. What we find is that banks that are, basically, the loans that are more affected, that means that you are in regions that they pass through the, the region was treated, then the banks are more prone to grant credit to consumer loans. Okay, so there's a higher acceptance rate of consumer loans. And interestingly, we find that there is no effect on other characteristics of consumer loans, race, maturity, etc. But yes, here we find that there's an increase in future default probability of these consumer loans. Okay, so we could argue that they are basically going to the fringe of the consumer loan. So there's a little increase in risk taking there. Okay? And finally, let me just finish by saying that we can run this also at the bank level. The results are basically the same. Why do I want to show this? Because I think that one of the things that is unfortunate for us, we can look at interest rates, we cannot look at fees. So someone could say, okay, you know, the whole picture is fees. We cannot, we cannot look at them at the individual basis, but we can look at them at the aggregate level. So if you look at the results on the, on, on the, on the screen, you can basically see that we don't find at the aggregate level, it's not so well identified, but there's no effects on fees. So we can basically think that there's no effect on the fee, but we cannot see them. At the, we want to be very clear with this. We cannot see them at the low level. Okay? So in a nutshell, that's the result. That's the paper. We're basically using, trying to analyze the statutory incidents. We actually argue that there are effects, there are economic effects of statutory incidents. So we line with this AER paper. There are frictions in the banking market that make it happen. We use for identification the shift in the Spanish mortgage market. And importantly, there's not only not a full pass-through, it's very heterogeneous, and especially something that I didn't talk about, is done by certain type of banks. Which type of banks? The ones that are, if you want, worse in the sense of higher NPLs and issues like that. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is something you can see. Can you hear as well? Okay, very good. So this is a fascinating paper. Lots of information, as you may have seen. You may not, ha not, may not have seen each line in uh, David's presentation, but you saw that there are many lines. And so uh, it's amazing amount of information about banking with lots of interesting, um, lots of interesting observations of which we can learn a lot. Uh, the paper is more or less pitched in another direction, namely in terms of public finance, about the basic theory of public finance. And these two sort of have to be translated one into the other. And this is a little bit what I want to focus on in my discussions. So let me just remind you of the textbook, Public Finance. And from then, we will have to make the jump into banking and link it to all the, um, all the lines in the tables of, uh, of uh, David. So textbook case, microeconomics 101, there's a com well, public finance 101, there's a competitive market for a single good. We have a demand function, uh, which depends on the price consumers are paying, PC, and the supply is uh, S, which is depending on the price suppliers 
are receiving PS, and this may be different if you have a good that is taxed, and the tax would be T, namely the difference between what the consumers are paying and what the suppliers are receiving, the rest goes to the government. Equilibrium is given by demand equals supply, equals supply. And so the important insight to start out with is what uh, is often called physical neutrality, uh, discovered variously in the 19th century, to my knowledge, uh, first written down by Jenkin in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, 1871 to 72, which basically says that equilibrium quantities do not depend on how the tax is statutorily distributed between consumers and producers. So these changes wouldn't matter for quantities. By the way, this reference is missing in the paper. There's lots of Jimenez, but no Jenkins. And uh, so um, the um, economic incidence uh, to the country is um, um, given by, in fact, different factors, and this is exactly what uh, the two, what the three authors are after. So the economic incidence is at the margin. In fact, uh, the whole literature is a little bit shaky, as I discovered when rereading some of that. So we're typically talking about small taxes, um, and at the margin, the consumers bear P prime, PC prime of T of the tax, and the producers bear one minus PC prime of T. And what is PC prime? That is the pass-through, at least the marginal pass-through, and that's given by the ratios of the corresponding elasticities, which are economic data and not uh, uh, statutory data. So in that sense, there is a difference between uh, statutory incidence and economic incidence. So the picture is... Um, the picture is, 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 is very simple, and the question is what is happening here? So here we have the market for mortgages, tax on the underlying mortgage collateral, um, as uh, David was explaining, in Spain in November 2018, for those who follow all the details of Spanish politics, uh, the statutory incidence passed from households to banks, i.e. to the suppliers of mortgages, and no change in tax rates. So that was a very interesting natural experiment with lots of variations which they really very, very nicely exploit. So on average, only approximately 80% of the tax change was passed on to the households through higher rates. Um, that is the uh, number they come up with. There's a large variation of pass-throughs depending on the household and local market characteristics, and there are no significant quantity changes. So that very much looks like the textbook model, except for the fact that, in fact, um, it seems to matter who is bearing the tax statutorily, which it shouldn't. So the question is, here's the textbook model. So we have um, supply, which is red, demand, which is blue, and we're asking the consumers to pay a certain tax T, which shifts the demand current downward, it downward and gives us a quantity Q star as the equilibrium quantity. So now um, the prime minister steps in and says, no, get rid of that and do it this way, and, uh, which in the end doesn't change the quantity, exactly as Jenkin has uh, proposed. And uh, we get this price, which is in fact determined by the elasticities of the two demand curves, and nothing has really changed. So that's the textbook picture, and the question is, is this a picture of this, of this paper? And so I just want to ask, what is different to the textbook case in this paper. And I will make a few remarks. I will start with the most basic one, uh, which I needed a little bit of time to understand because the model, the paper is not too explicit about it. So um, let's see. Um, mortgages are not spot transactions. By their very nature, they are credit transactions. And so that means there is no such thing as a price you're paying in exchange for the good. In fact, you're paying an interest rate which is paid later in various kinds of uh, forms. And so how to translate this P of the textbook model into the R of the banking model? Let's do this simple, very simple accounting, um, uh, accounting um, model where in fact I'm simplifying uh, dramatically, for example, I'm ignoring default just to get it to, to track the payments here because that's after all what we're after. How do payments uh, account for what is happening. Suppose banks lend 
a mortgage B at a possible markup M, let's say they make a profit on this, who knows, households pay a tax capital T, um, provide a collateral, which is in this uh, institutional setting, the mortgage liability, let's call it C, let RT be the mortgage interest, DT the annual discharge, and M the maturity of the mortgage. So this is really just accounting for the flows. So what happens is now the mortgage size is given by, let's call it a haircut, I mean this, this markdown, H, where um, we see that B, so the mortgage size is a fraction of the collateral. And uh, then there is a tax which is levied on the collateral in, in, in this institutional setting, which is, uh, let's say, a fraction Q of, of C. And so that's the framework. So what does the bank do in the pre-November world? The bank has this kind of uh, outflow of B, which is the money it provides to the household. Maybe it makes, up, makes this little markup of M times B as well. And what it gets over the horizon of the mortgage is um, the interest plus the discharge all uh, discounted down to, um, to um, oh, there's, there's a one, there's a, to the teeth power missing, I'm sorry, um, times B. And so that's how you are, um, how you are uh, ca accounting for the payments, sorry, for this missing uh, factor. Uh, for this missing exponent, of course, that's the heart of the matter. So now suppose banks pay the tax, so we are changing. So what happens? If the bank adjusts interest and discharge by D, let's say now you're changing what the household is going to pay back to you, um, potentially D should be positive because you want to recover a little bit of the outlaw. So on the left-hand side now you're uh, having to put up the mortgage payment plus the markup, and you also have to pay the tax T, and on the right-hand side uh, the thing is adjusted by the delta which you are paying extra each period. Let's keep it uh, constant for, and as I said, simplifying dramatically. So this is hopefully big enough. Yeah, I mean, to some extent it is. So um, what you're getting there is for this, for this um, markup D, uh, for this markup delta, um, is this very simple mechanic equation. Uh, it should be uh, given by uh, the discounted value of that should be given by T over B, um, i.e. by the uh, ratio of the tax, uh, tax over the haircut. So the result is a very mechanical relation at a full pass through, namely that the delta that is actually charged to the households after the reform is given by this somewhat complicated expression, standard geometric series, etc. Let's call this right-hand side delta hat, which is sort of the, the the cutoff value. If delta is smaller than delta hat, there is no full pass through. If delta is equal to delta hat in this very simple simplified model, then there is full pass through. Mm? So since the paper is pitched in terms of addressing this basic public finance question, the question is going to be whether delta is equal to delta hat or whether it's not. So the interpretation, this is a highly nonlinear uh, expression in M and R bar, negative relation between interest rate markup delta and collateral haircut H. And the empirics in table seven, as uh, David was uh, mentioning, says there's no impact of the tax reform on B and M, significant effect on delta, namely a positive effect, so there's a positive markup and uh, a significant effect on H. Uh, so the haircut parameter. So the conclusion from this very simple table is there can't be a full pass-through because uh, purely mechanically you can't have uh, H increasing and delta increasing. So there must be something happening which is less than a full pass-through. And I think that's a very interesting argument. Uh, I, I would put the emphasis a little bit differently. I mean, it's not, I mean, the real question is not whether delta is positive. We would expect some pass-through to happen. So that's fine. And uh, so all of the discussions in the paper very ingeniously show what influences this delta for what types of borrowers, et cetera, et cetera. I think the really, I mean, at least as, as you pitch it in terms of public finance, the question is whether delta is equal to delta hat. And, uh, and in fact, there is nothing reported in the paper. You just tell us you do it. But I would like to see some type of accounting model really giving us an idea of what's happening here. And so I had to come up with this Mickey Mouse model. It would be nice to see something more professional to understand whether your main claim, namely economic incidence is not uh, valid, is correct. 
Uh, what is different too, so I, I have to stop at one stage once you guys stop me. Um, I just have a few more slides. And so, I mean, uh, this was a technical point I was making, but I think it's important because it, uh, it would be uh, really helping the reader to understand what's going on. Um, if you're talking about economic incidents, then this should be the core of the analysis. And then the regressions on really determining delta is uh, sort of, or beta in your model, is, is sort of important for all the banking theory, but less so for the public finance theory. So since mortgages are credit transactions, as I said, the buyers are by construction liquidity constraints. So in that sense, the original argument is not quite obvious to make because the original argument says it doesn't matter who is bearing the tax. Point is, if you're liquidity constrained, you can't bear it. So the consequence, in fact, it may be efficient uh, to let the banks pay the tax. And uh, the resulting efficiency gain is passed on partially. I mean, we don't know what happens to efficiency gains in, 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 in such models. But in fact, this doesn't seem to be a contradiction to statutory incidence neutrality. So in that sense, that may be an argument to be considered instead of the standard attack on the uh, public finance theory, which does not fully apply here in this sense, I think. Um, is my argument I was just giving plausible I guess not really because the tax is really quite small, and I think that is something which is applying to the overall argument as well. In fact, based on these average values, if you do this, these little uh, um, uh, calculations, the tax is approximately um, 2,400 euros. Um, and uh, so if you're buying a house with average value of like uh, um, 170,000 or whatever, or 160,000, whatever the number is in there, this is not so much of a, of a concern, I think, if you're a liquidity constraint, then you don't buy that house in the first place, but you don't care too much about these 2,000. Let me incidentally make the remark that the whole loss in the pass-through, if it's correctly calculated in the paper, is approximately 20% of that, so it's 480 euros. I mean, we're talking about transactions in the area of 150 to 200,000 uh, euros, on, uh, sort of, in, 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 in general. I mean. Passing on 480 euros, yes or no, may be sort of um, second order. It's, it's pretty nice because we are, theory tells us we should indeed only consider marginal changes. But here I see the marginal principle at work because we're talking about really small fry and the question is what can we draw from that? Okay, so the main conclusion you are drawing, David, is, and, and I think you're right, the mortgage market may not be competitive, and this is where we enter banking, local market power by local banks, informational capture and banking relations, household inexperience, et cetera, et cetera. So the first reaction would be, in this case, expect delta to be larger than delta hat. Of course, the second reaction upon reflection, no, we need a theory of tax incidents and imperfectly competitive markets. Uh, we don't have this in the paper because you sort of build up that, uh, I wouldn't call it straw man, but you build up this sort of benchmark model of uh, incidents in perfectly competitive markets. And so what is missing is a model of imperfectly competitive markets in uh, banking with taxes, which is a huge, um, uh, a huge bite to take. And uh, so what I have done here, I won't bore you with that. Um, I mean, if you can, you can do this for a monopoly, where well, I found it quite, quite illuminating. It was good that dinner wasn't too long last night. And so it's, in fact, quite interesting. So some of the principles of the perfectly competitive world are, in fact, holding up. And uh, so the Jenkin neutrality principle holds, which is consistent with the paper. Um, more on tax incidents means that, in fact, the uh, economic incidents principle does not hold. I will not bore you with that. Uh, just uh, study papers like Whale and Fabinger that you referenced. And the theory seems to be underdeveloped in this field. I think there is, uh, I wasn't aware of this, um, that for these markets, which seem to be the most important markets in our economy, we don't have a very well-developed um, theory of tax incidents. And you guys have, among others, the merit to point this out. So let me skip that as well. Um, it may, in fact, not be public finance or banking. It may just be the housing market, which works strangely for various reasons. I'm not going to go through that. Let me conclude here. Sorry, uh, Angel, for uh, stretching your patience. Uh, so it's a very nice, thought-provoking paper with a wealth of data, an interesting natural experiment, a very careful econometric analysis, and an interesting economic theory of tax incidents under partial consumer ignorance in the appendix. Um, I didn't get into that at all. Um, I rather am interested more in the mechanics of the, of the, of the formulas that you're presenting. And so I would think there's more to be done in terms of understanding the empirical findings. 
uh, is this a paper about a fundamental problem of public finance, which incidentally concerns a problem of imperfect banking competition with non-trivial intertemporal pricing? Or is this a paper about uh, imperfect competition in banking, which involves a conceptually difficult problem of public finance? Both interpretations are possible. It would be nice sort of to choose a little bit the lines along which you want to move forward here. But uh, I really enjoyed reading this. Sorry for the um, full pass-through of the time. Sorry. <laughs> so, thank you, Elu. I mean, it's always a pleasure to hear your thoughts about everything, especially about one of my papers. So, thank you very much. <laughs> no, um, yeah, Jenkins, totally agree. I, I'm very scared about going back in history. I actually found references. Sorry, I actually even found re references back to the... 1800 about yeah, other yeah, authors, but anyway, yes, I agree. Um, sorry, uh, we should be cleaner in how we do the net present value, which is basically what you did. We should be cleaner with that. My, our fault. We'll, we'll, we'll try to address it. Basically, the main idea is what you were doing, but in a, anyway. That, so yeah. Now uh, about efficiency gains, I agree. That was my thought. Like that's why I didn't talk to you about. But then I we, we wanted to see if overall, like we we tracked if individuals that were asking for mortgages were actually asking for less or more credit to get to that point, and we see no effect. So we actually think this is more related to tax and awareness than that. But yes, in principle, I was thinking, well, this can be totally efficient. I mean, you, you want to pass all the costs to the guy that can, that has the lowest beta, if you want, the, the lower intertemporal discount factor. But it doesn't seem that that's what happens. So anyway, a fair point. Yeah, the quant are we on the marginal terms or not? I mean, I don't want to fight that. I mean, it's, we have what we have. The argument could be that, you know, it's marginal, but when we aggregate, and that's why I think the spillover effects are interesting also. It's, it might be marginal for an individual, then we do back of the envelope how much this costs, for example, for example, for the government, because there's a reduction. That might not be so marginal. We're then talking about, I don't remember out of the top of my head, but I think it was like a 300 million euros or something a year. So anyway, that's fine. And then new theory, yeah, I would love it. <laughs> but you know, it's, <laughs> I, I, I think the paper is, is long, but yes, I think this is pointing out. What is it pointing out to? And this is my, very my personal thing. I, I really don't know. So I really don't know if this is a public finance question in which, you know, it has interesting banking aspects to it, or is it an interesting banking aspect that has? It's our job to do it. Mm -hmm. I have to think more deeply on it, because I think it's both. Mm -hmm. So I have to basically argue with my co-authors, which is the best thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there any question from the audience, please? Thanks, David. I really like the result about low-income borrowers. I thought it was very interesting. It suggests, in the Weil and Favinger model, it suggests that the low-income borrowers are the inelastic ones, in some sense. But in other areas of household finance, uh, people say that low-income borrowers are sometimes inelastic for a more behavioral reason, like they're not paying attention to the contract, they're not negotiating as efficiently or as aggressively as they could. Etc. I don't know if you have anything that can speak to that. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that if it looks like the low-income borrowers are more elastic, no, less elastic, the liquidity constraint story also doesn't really apply again, right? Because if they were liquidity constrained, they would be the most elastic. So again, what Elo said, I think I agree that the, the liquidity numbers are just too small to matter. But mainly I want to hear about your thoughts about these low-income people. So, yeah, I mean, I want to stick a bit to the model, to, what, to, to the data we have. So we don't have good measures of, you know, awareness, awareness or anything like that. But indeed, the results and actually the teeny tiny model that we built at the end is based on this idea that basically you are unaware, you don't have bargaining power, you're low income, then you're basically inelastic. The result of that model is you're basically inelastic. Whereas when you have bargaining power, even if you're unaware, you have some elasticity there. So that's the real functioning of the micro model that we built. Now, can I say if that is, if, if they are more or less unaware? I mean, not really. I think that for this type of tax, the crucial point, we goes to your second point and to Elus, is we're talking about small proportion, and this is important, small proportional numbers. So, you know, for a low income, 
a low-income borrower, we would be talking about a tax rate of 600, 700 euros. For a high income, it would be 4,000 euros. So, you know, that, that's the thing. But I, I'm sorry I cannot tell you more on that. I'm just telling you how it works. It's effectively, as, as you're pointing out, is that these two things together make you inelastic. That, that's how the model works. Is there another question? It's not just, I mean, I'm going to uh, follow up on, on, on the comment that this is not exactly price for price. The, the, when the consumer pays for it, you pay for it in cash, the tax, 2,000 euros. When the bank pays for it, you pay for it over time, 30-year financing on an interest rate. I wonder if the opportunity cost for the, for the borrower is very different, and it's very dependent on the, on the cost of, the, you know, at what rate do you borrow? Um, and I, then I wonder, can you infer something about that? What is the shallow cost of borrowing for the consumers based on, based on the pattern? Maybe there's something else you can say about consumer financing using taking a stance on the model. OK, so uh, that's why we didn't want to talk about welfare or welfare gains or efficiency, exactly that point. I mean, we are transferring, and probably low-income people have different discount rates, you know, shadow values, as you're saying, of this. So we were very worrisome of saying anything about that part. Now, what, and again, sorry for that. Given that I didn't show it, it's very difficult for you to, to bag it out. But basically, that what we argue is that, in essence, when we do go, we can go loan by loan, observe what they are paying. You know, what we don't see is what's the shadow value that they would be able to pay. Okay, that, that, that for sure. So that's how we try to recover in a loan-by-loan -loan basis what is the pass-through that we are serving for different individuals. Of course, you're saying that you, you can see that there's a relationship. Low-income individuals are on the margin being charged higher rates, so you could back from there that probably they are willing to pay more, so then the efficiency gain would be higher for those individuals. Now, backtracking that welfare gain in the setup, I'm a bit scared of doing it. But Let's talk over, <laughs> over coffee, because probably you give me some hints of how to do it. I'm just, I can tell you that, but that's where we stopped. Because I'm, you know, from there, computing the actual shadow cost, probably there are ways of doing it. We didn't go that way. But it, may, it might be a relevant way to go. OK. If there is not another question, I think that thank you, David. Thank you, Elu, for this, uh, the presentation, and the other presenters and the discussions because I think we have had a very comprehensive session analyzing this intermediation, new intermediation, and traditional intermediation. So I think it's time for coffee. I will resume at 11.30. Thank you. Good. Sorry, I just...